Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 14, Forest School. Tell me, Anastasia, is this the way your parents brought you up? She responded after a brief pause, during which I gathered she was recollecting her childhood. I remember particularly nothing of my papa or mama in the flesh. I was brought up by my grandfather and great-grandfather, pretty much as I have explained to you. But you see, I myself had a good feeling very early on for nature in the animal world around me. Perhaps I was not aware of all the details of how it operated, but that is not the important thing when one has a feeling for it. Grandfather and great-grandfather would approach me from time to time and ask questions and expect me to answer them. In our culture, older generation treat an infant or young child virtually as a deity and use the child's response as a check on their own purity. I began asking Anastasia to recall some specific question and answer. She smiled and told me. Once I was playing with a little snake, I turned around and there were grandfather and great-grandfather standing right beside me smiling. I was very delighted since it was always interesting being with them. They are the only ones who can ask me questions and their hearts beat in the same rhythm as mine. But with animals, it's, it is different. I ran over to them. I ran over to them. Great-grandfather bowed to me while grandfather took me on his knees. I listened to his heartbeat and I f fingered the hairs on his beard as I examined them. Nobody spoke. We were thinking together and it was good that way. Then grandfather asked me, tell me Anastasia, why do you think my hair grows here and here? Pointing to the top of his head and his beard and not here. Pointing to his nose and forehead. I touch his nose and forehead. But no reply was forthcoming. I could not give an unthinking answer. I had to understand it. The next time they came, Grandfather again said, Well, I am still thinking. Why my hair grows here and not here? Again indicating his nose and forehead. Great-Grandfather looked at me seriously and attentively. Then I thought, Perhaps it is really a serious question with him, and I ask. Grandfather, what is it? Do you really want your hair to grow everywhere, even on your nose and forehead? Great-Grandfather began pondering the question. Well, Great-Grandfather replied, No, not really. Then that is why your hair does not grow there, because you do not want it to. He reflected on that, stroking his beard, and mused as though he were putting the question to himself. And if it grows here, that means it is because I want it to. I confirm his thought. Of course, Grandfather, not only you, but I, and the one who thought you up. At this point, Great-Grandfather asked me rather excitedly, And who is that? thought him up. Who is, and who is that thought him up? The one who thought everything up, I reply. But where is he? Show me, great-grandfather asks, bowing to me. I could not give him an answer right away, but the question stayed with me and I started thinking about it often. And did you eventually give him an answer? I asked Anastasia. I gave him an answer about a year later, and then he started asking me more questions. 
But up until the time I gave the answer, neither grandfather nor great-grandfather had asked me any new questions, and I began to get very concerned. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 15 Attentiveness to Man I asked Anastasia, who taught her to speak and converse, if she had almost no memory of her father and mother, and her grandfather and great-grandfather talk with her only rarely. The answers she gave were quite shocked to me and require interpretation by specialists. And so I shall try to reproduce them as fully as I can. Their meaning had, has gradually begun, begun to sink in for me. She responded to my first question with a question of her own. Do you mean the ability to speak in different people's languages? How do you mean different? What you can speak more than one language? Yes, she replied, including German, French, English, Japanese, Chinese. Yes, she repeated and then added, you can see I speak your language. You mean Russian? Well, that is too general. I speak or at least try to speak using words and phrases you yourself use when you talk. At first, it was a little challenging for me since your vocabulary is not very large and you repeat yourself a fair amount. Nor do you have much expression of feeling. That is not the kind of language which easily lends itself to accurately, accurately save, saying everything one wishes to say. Wait, Anastasia. I'm going to ask you something in a foreign language and you give me an answer. I said hello to her in English, then in French. She answered me right off. Unfortunately, I myself have not mastered any foreign language. In school, I studied German, but with that rather poor marks. I did remember one whole sentence in German, which my schoolmates and I learnt by, by rote. I recited it to Anastasia. Ich liebe dich, Hand, Rich, Herr Hand. She extended her hand to me and answered in German, I give you my hand. Amazed by what I had heard and still not believing my ears, I asked, so then any person can be taught any language. I had an intuitive feeling that there must be some kind of simple explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon, and I had to know what it was so I could tell others about it. Anastasia, perhaps you could explain this in my language and try to do it with examples so that I can understand. I ask somewhat excitedly. All right, all right, only calm down and let go or you will not understand. But let me first teach you to write in Russian. I know how to write. You tell me about teaching foreign languages. I do not mean just handwriting. I should teach you to be a writer, a very talented writer. You shall write a book. That's impossible. It is possible. It is quite simple. Anastasia took a stick and outlined on the ground the whole Russian alphabet along with the pronunciation marks and asked me how many letters there were. 33, I replied. You see, this is a very small number of letters. Can you call what I have outlined a book? No, I answer. It's just an ordinary alphabet. That's all ordinary letters. Yet all the books in the Russian language are made up of these ordinary letters, Anastasia observed. Do you not agree? Do you not see how simple it all is? Yes, but in books there, they're arranged differently. Correct. All books consist of a multitude of combinations of these letters. People arrange them on the pages automatically guided by their feelings. 
and from this it follows that books origin originate not from a combination of letters and sounds, but from feelings outlined by people's imagination. The result is that the readers are aroused by approximately the same feelings as the writers, and such feelings can be recalled for a long time. Can you recollect any images or situation from books you have read? Yes, I can, I replied, after a moment's thought. For some reason, I recall Lumertov's hero of her time and began to tell the story to Anastasia. She interrupted me. You see, you can still depict the characters from this book and tell me what they felt, even though quite a bit of time has gone by since you read it. But if I were to ask you to tell me and in what sequence the 30 letters, 33 letters of the Russian alphabet were set forth in that book, what combinations they were arranged in, could you do that? No, that would be, that would be very dif difficult. So feelings have been conveyed from one man to another with the help of all sorts of combination of these 33 letters. You looked at these combination of letters and forgot them right off. But the feelings and image, images remain to be remembered for a long time. So it turns out that if emotional feelings are directly associated with these marks on paper without thinking about any conventions, one soul will cause these marks to appear in just the right sequence and combination so that any reader may subsequently feel the soul of the writer. And if in the soul of the writer, wait, Anastasia, speak more simply, simple, more clearly, more specifically, show me through some kind of an example how languages are to be taught. You can make me into a writer later on. Tell me first, who taught you to understand different languages and how? My great grandfather replied, Anastasia. Give me an example. I ask anxious to understand everything in a hurry. All right, but do not be concerned. I should still find a way to help you understand. And if it is that important to you, I should try teaching all the languages to you. It is simple after all. For us, it's quite incredible in Anastasia. So do try to explain. And tell me how much time will it take to teach me? She thought for a moment, looked at me, and then said, Your memory is not very good. And then there are your, and, and there, and then there are your domestic problems. You will need a lot of time. How long, how long I was impatient for an answer. For everyday comprehensions of phrases such as hello, and goodbye, I would say it will take at least four months, possibly six, she replied. Enough, Anastasia. Tell me how your great-grandfather did it. He played with me. How did he play? Tell me. Calm down. Let go. I cannot understand why you are un, un impatient, why you are so impatient. And then she quietly went on. Great-grandfather played with me as though he were joking with me. Whenever he came to me all by himself, without grandfather, he would always approach me, bow at the waist and hold out his hand to me. And I would hold out mine to him. He would first shake my hand, then get down on one knee, kiss my hand and say, Hello, Anastasia. One time he came, he did everything as usual. His eyes looked at me tenderly as usual. But his lips were saying some kind of abracadabra. I looked at him in, a, in surprise, and he said something else, equally unintelligible. I could not take it any longer and asked, Grandpa Kins, have you forgotten what to say? 
Yes, I have, great-grandfather answered. Then he stepped away from me a few paces, stopped to think about something, and came over to me again, extended his hand to me, and held out mine to him. He dropped on one knee and kissed my hand. His look was gentle. His lips were moving, but no sound was coming out. I was even a bit afraid. Then I decided a reminder might help. Hello, Anastasia, I, I hinted. Correct, great-grandfather confirmed with a smile. At that point, I realized it was a game. He and I would often play games together after that. At first, it was quite simple. But then the game became more complicated and more fascinating. It is a game that begins when one is three years old and goes on until the age of 11. When one undergoes a kind of test, this involves looking attentively at the person you are talking with and being able to understand what they are saying, no matter what language they are expressing it in. This kind of dialogue is far superior to speech. It is more rapid and conveys far more information. You would call it through, you would call it thought transfer. You think it, it is abnormal, something out of fantasy, but it is simply an attentive attitude toward men, drawing upon a developed imagination and a good memory. It involves not just a more efficient method of information exchange, but getting to know a person's soul along with the animal and plant world and what constitutes creation as a whole. Anastasia, I said, what do plants growing in a garden plot have to do with this? What is their role in all this? What do you mean? What have they to do with it? At the same time, as the child is getting to know the world of plants as a part of the functioning of the universe, he is also entering into contact with his planets. With their help and the help of his parents, he quickly, very quickly gets to know the truth and develops intensively in the fields of psychology, philosophy, and in the natural sciences, your, your disciplines. But if the game goes on and some kind of man-made object from the artificial world is used as an example, the child will become lost. He will not receive any assistance from the powers of nature or the universe. I have already noted, Anastasia, that in the final analysis, such a child could become an agronomist. Now, where would his knowledge come from in other areas? But Anastasia maintained that a man raised in such a manner would show an aptitude, ap, ap, aptitude for quick learning in any of our scholarly disciplines. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 16 Flying Saucers, Nothing Extraordinary then I asked her to show me an example of her knowledge of some technical subject. You want me to tell you how all the different machines of your world operate? The kind of thing our prominent scientists are only touching the fringes of? Why don't you make some great scientific discovery, let's say? That is what I have been doing for you the whole time you have been here. Not just for me, for the world of science a discovery they would be prepared to recognize. Go ahead, make a verifiable discovery in some technical, technical field like spaceships, the atom, automobile fuel, since you say it's all so simple. In comparison with what I have just shown you, those fields you mentioned are something like, to use a term from your language, the Stone Age. That's perfect, something you consider primitive, but at least I'll be able to understand it. 
you can prove you're right and show evidence that your intelligence is superior to mine. Tell me, for example, what do you think of our airplanes and spaceships? Pretty close to perfect machines. No, they are altogether primitive. They only serve to show how primitive the technocratic path of development is. That remark put me on my guard since I realized that either her conclusions were those of madwomen or she really knew far more than someone with an ordinary consciousness could ever imagine. I continued my questioning. What do you mean when you say our rockets and planes are primitive? Anastasia responded after a brief pause as though allowing time for her words to sink in. The functioning of all your machines Every single one of them is based on the energy of explosion. Not knowing any more efficient natural sources of energy, you resort to such primitive, awkward substitutes with incredible stubbornness. And even the destructive consequences of their use do not stop you. The range of your airplanes and rockets is simply laughable. According to the scale of the universe, they rise a wee tiny bit above the earth, and now this method has practically reached a ceiling. Do not you agree? But that is ridiculous. An exploding or burning substance propels some monstrous structure that you call a spaceship, and the greater part of this ship is designed precisely to solve this problem of population. population. And what might be an alternative principle of movement to the atmosphere? A flying saucer might be a good example, Anastasia responded. What? You know about flying saucers and their population systems? Of course I know. It is very simple and rational. I felt my throat go dry and tried to hurry her up. Tell me, Anastasia, quickly in a way I can understand. All right. Only do not get excited. It will be harder to understand when you are excited. The the propulsion principle of a flying saucer is based on the energy of generating a vacuum. How so? Be more precise. You have a limited vocabulary, yet I am compelled to restrict myself to it so that you can understand me. Well, I'll add to it. I blurted out in agitation. I'll add words like jar, lid, tablet, air, and I began to quickly name all the words that just popped into my head at that moment and even let out a few swear words. Anastasia broke in. You need not um, bother. I already know all the words you can express yourself with. But there are still others. And besides that, there is whole different method of conveying information. If I use that, I could explain everything to you in a minute. As things stand now, it may take an hour or two. There is a lot and I really wanted to tell you about something else, something much more meaningful. No, Anastasia, tell me about flying saucers and their population methods. Tell me about energy carriers. Until I understand that, I shan't listen to anything else. All right, she acquiesced, and then went on. An explosion occurred, occurs when a solid substance quickly changes under a definable influence into gaseous form or when in the course of a reaction. Two gaseous substances evolve into something even lighter. Everyone, of course, understand this part. Yes, I replied. If powder is ignited, it becomes a smoke and liquid fuel becomes gas. Yes, more or less. But if you or your people had purer thoughts and consequently a knowledge of the functionings of nature, you would have long ago become aware that if there is a substance capable of instant explosion, 
and through explosion transformation into another state, the opposite process must also hold true. In nature, there are living microorganisms that transform gaseous substances into solids. All plants do this in fact only at varying speeds and with varying degrees of firmness and solidity of the resulting substance. Take, take a look around you and you will see that plants take in liquid from the earth and breathe air. And then a process. And then process these into a hard and solid body. Let us say wood or something even harder and more solid like a nutshell or a plum stone. A microorganism smaller than the eye can see. Does this, does this with fantastic speed of feeding. It would seem on air alone. It is this same kinds, it is the same kinds of microorganisms that power flying saucers. They are like the micro cells in the brain only their operation has a very, very narrow focus. Their sole function is propulsion, but they carry out this function to perfection and they can accelerate a flying saucer to one nineteenth the speed of the average modern earth dweller's thought. These microorganisms are located on the inner surface of the upper part of the flying saucer and positioned between its double walls which are set approximately three centimeters apart. The upper and lower surface of the outer walls are porous with micro-sized pinholes. The microorganisms draws, draw in all air through these pinholes, thereby creating a vacuum ahead of the saucer. The streams of air begin to con- congel, congel even before contact with the saucer. And as they pass through the microorganisms, they are transformed into tiny spheres. Then these spheres are enlarged even more to approximately half a centimeter in diameter. They lose their firmness and slide down between the walls into the lower part of the saucer, where they again decompose into a gaseous substance. You can even eat them if you can do this before they decompose. What about the walls of the flying saucer? What are they made of? They they are cultivated ground. How so? Why the surprise? Just give a little thought. You will figure it out. Many people cultivate a fungus in various kinds of containers. The fungus imbues the water in which it is placed with a pleasant, slightly acidic flavor and takes the shape of the container. This fungus is very similar to a flying saucer. It creates a double wall around itself. If another microorganism is added to its water, it produces a con- con- um, conjunct. But that so-called microorganism can be produ- produced or rather generated by the power of the wall or the brain, much like a vivid concept of imagery, I mean concept or imagery. Can you do this? I ask. Yes, but I do not have sufficient power of my own. The action of several dozen people having the same ability is required, and it takes about a year all to all told. And can one find on our earth everything necessary to make or grow, as you say, such a flying saucer in the microorganisms? Of course, one can. The earth has everything that the universe has. But how do you get the microorganism inside the walls of the saucer if they are so small you can't even see them? Once the upper wall is cultivated, it will attract and collect them in huge numbers, just as bees are attracted to cells. But this process also requires the collective will of several dozen dozen people. In any case, What is the use of elaborating further if you cannot cultivate it for lack of people with the right kind of will, intelligence, and knowledge? 
Isn't there some way you could help? I could. So do it. I have already. What have you done? I was still perplexed. I told you how children should be raised. And I can tell you more. You must tell this to others. Many will understand and their children raised in this manner will have the intelligence, knowledge, and while permitting them to make not only a primitive flying saucer, but significantly more. Anastasia, how do you know so much about flying saucers? Does that too come through your communication with plants? They have landed here and I, well, I help the occupants repair their ship. Are they much smarter than us? Not at all. They have a long way to get to attain the level of man. They are afraid of us, afraid to approach people, even though they are very curious. At first, they were afraid of me. They trained their mental paralysis, paralysis on me, put on quite a show. They tried to frighten me, shock me. It was quite a challenge to calm them down and convince them I would only treat them with affection. Well, how can they be less smart than us if they can do things man can't do yet? What is so surprising about that, bees too make incredible structure out of natural materials, including whole ventilation and heating heating system. But that does not mean they are superior to men in intelligence. In the universe, there is no one and nothing stronger than man except God. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 17, The Brain, a Supercomputer, The Possibility of Building a Flying Saucer, greatly interests me. If one examines the principle of propulsion, propulsion just as hypothesis, it is still a new one. A flying saucer, however, is a complex machine and is not a high priority item for us earthlings. For that reason, I wanted to hear something that would be understandable right away. I wanted a something that did not require any investigation of scholarly minds, but could be immediately put into practice in our daily lives and benefit everyone. I began asking Anastasia to come up with a solution to a question that our society was being confronted with today. She agreed, but asked, could you at least put it in more specific terms? This question, how can I solve something when I do not know what you have in mind? I began thinking, what was the number one problem we face today? And the following terms came to mind. You know, anesthesia, our major cities right now are confronted with a most acute problem. Environmental pollution. The air in these cities and these cities is so bad it's hard to breathe. But you yourselves are the ones polluting it. We realize that. Please hear me out. Only don't go philosophizing about how we must be pure ourselves, have more trees around and so forth. Just take things as they are today and think of something. For example, how to reduce the pollution in our major cities by 50% without costing the treasury, the government, that is any extra money. And make it so that your plan would be the most logical of all possible alternatives and that it will be capable of instant implementation so that I and everyone else cannot fail to understand it. I should try at once, Anastasia replied. Have you specified all the terms? I thought I should try and make it even more complex just in case her mind and abilities really turn out to be truly superior to what our own powers of reasoning allowed. So I added, and make whatever you think of to be 
profit generating. For whom? For, for me and for the country too. You live within the borders of Russia. So make it the whole of Russia. Are we talking about money? Yes. An enormous amount of money. Profit, Anastasia. But money is never an enormous amount. But I need enough money to be able to pay for this expedition and have enough left over for a new one. And as for Russia, I thought for a moment, I thought, what if Anastasia were even a little interested in the material benefits of our civilization? And then ask, you wouldn't want anything for yourself. I have everything, she replied. But all at once, an idea came to me, something that might possibly interest her. How about this, Anastasia? Let's have your plan. Make enough money to provide free seeds, or at least seeds, at a discount to all your beloved Dashniks or gardeners throughout Russia. Terrific, Anastasia exclaimed. What a wonderful idea. If you have finished, I shall now get to work. How delightful that sounds. Seeds is, or is there anything else you wish to add? No, Anastasia, that's enough for now. I felt her inspiration and excitement, not only over the task itself, but especially over the fire, the free seeds for her Dachniks. Yet I still felt convinced that even with her special abilities, a solution to the problem of air pollution was simply out of the question. Else our many scientific institutions would have come up with one long ago. With a, with a bustle of energy this time, not her usual calm and quiet self, Anastasia lay down on the grass, her arms wide spread, her curled fingers reached their cush cushion tips upward, alternating between motion and stillness, while her eyelids tremble on her closed eyes. She lay there for about 20 minutes, then opened her eyes, sat up, and said, I have determined the nature of the problem, but what a nightmare it is. What have you determined, and what's this about a nightmare? The greatest harm is coming from your so-called automobiles. There are so many of them in the large cities and every one of them is emitting both an unpleasant odor and substances harmful to human bodies. The most frightening thing is that these substances are mixing with earth or dust particles and impregnating the dust. The movement of the automobiles picks up the impact impregnated dust and people are breathing in this horrible mess. It gets swept into the air and then settles on the grass and the trees covering everything around. This is very bad. It is very harmful to the health of both people and plants. Of course it's bad. Everybody knows it's bad. Only nobody can do anything about it. We have street cleaning machines, but they can't keep up. You, Anastasia, have discovered absolutely nothing new. You haven't thought up any original solution to purify our air. All I did just now was to determine the basis source of the danger. Now I shall think about it further and, uh, and analyze it. I need to concentrate for a long time, perhaps as long as an hour, since I have never dealt with a problem like this before so that you will not be bored. Do you go for a walk in the forest? Or you get on with your thinking. I'll find something to do. And Anastasia withdrew into herself. Coming back an hour later, after a walk in the forest, I found her, as it appeared to me, in a state of some discontent. And I said, you see, Anastasia, you and that brain of yours aren't capable of doing anything either. Only don't worry about it. We've got a lot of scientific institutions working on this question. But they, just like you, can only describe the fact that pollution is going on. They haven't been able to do anything about it yet. 
She answered in somewhat apolo apologetic tone. I have gone over in my mind, I believe, all the possible variants, but I do not see any way of quickly reducing the pollution by 50%. My mind was at once set on the alert. She had found some sort of solution after all. So what kind of reduction do you come with? with? Come up with, I asked. She sighed. Not that much. I managed to achieve, to achieve 35 to 40 percent. What? I couldn't help exclaim. Pretty poor result, eh? I asked Anastasia. A lump formed in my throat. I realized she was incapable of lying, exaggerating or downplaying anything she said. Trying to restrain my excitement, I said, let's change the terms of the projects. Let's say 38 percent. Quick. Tell me what you come up with. Your automobiles must be equipped to not only scatter this foul dust, but to collect it as well. How can we do that? Talk faster. Those things sticking out in the front of the automobiles, what are they called? Bumpers, I offered. All right, bumpers. Inside them or below them should be attached a little box with small holes facing frontwards. There should also be holes on its backside so that air can escape. While the automobiles are in motion, air laden with this harmful dust will be drawn in through the front holes, purified and then escaped through the back holes. And that air will already be 20% less polluted. And what about the remaining 20%? Right, now virtually none of this dust is removed. But with this method, there will be a lot less of it in the air, since it will be collected all over the place every day. I have calculated that in one month, with the help of these little box, boxes, if they are fitted on all automobiles, the amount of polluting dust will decrease by 40%. Beyond that, there will be no reduction since other factors are at work. What size of boxes and what should they contain? How many holes and what distance from each other? Vladimir, perhaps you would like me to personally attach them to every single automobile. For the first time, I perceived that Anastasia had a sense of humor, and I began to laugh at the thought of her attaching her little boxes to all the cars. She laughed too, <laughs> delighting in my cheerful mood, and began whirling her way across the glade. The principle was really very simple. The rest was merely a question of logistics. Already without Anastasia help, I was beginning to imagine how it could all be. Orders from ad administrative heads, motor vehicles inspection control, turning in old filters for new ones at filling station, a system of vouchers and so forth, a routine regulation just like seat belts. All it had taken back then was one stroke of the pen and presto. Seat belts in every family car. And here too, one stroke of the pen, and again, presto. Cleaner air, and there would be tough competition among entrepreneurs for orders, for orders to supply the boxes. A good idea of work for the manufacturing plants. And the main thing, of course, cleaner air. Wait, I said, turning once more to Anastasia, who was still whirling around on a storage stance. What should be put into those boxes? Into those boxes, into those boxes. You will come up with a little something. It is very simple, she replied, without stopping. And where is my money going to come from? And to supply seeds for the Dutchniks, came another question. She stopped. What do you mean? Where from? You wanted my idea to be the most rational of all, and that is exactly what I have thought of. The most rational solution there can be. It will spread to large cities throughout the world, and for this idea, they will pay Russia enough to supply the free seeds, and enough to pay you. Only you will receive your payment under certain conditions. I didn't pay attention immediately to her remark about the certain conditions but began focusing in on something else. So we could 
we could so so we should patent it otherwise we would pay off we would pay off their own free will why would they not pay they will pay and i can even set the rates right now from the production of these boxes russia will get two percent and you will get one hundredth of a percent. What's the good of your setting the rates? You do have a few strong points, but when it comes to business, you're still a complete ignoramus. Nobody will pay voluntarily, even when there are signed agreements. They don't always pay. If only you knew how many, how many there are in the world that don't. Our attribution courts are overloaded. By the way, do you know what an arbitration court is? I can guess, but in this case, they will pay faithfully. Anyone who does not pay will go bankrupt. Only honest people will prosper. What will make them go bankrupt? Don't tell me you're in the racket business. What are you imagining now? Think about it. They themselves, or rather, circumstances themselves, will overtake any cheaters and make them go bankrupt. And then the thought dawned to me on me, given that Anastasia is incapable of lying, and as she herself said, the system inherits and nature do not allow her to make a mistake. It means that before stating any conclusion, she must have processed in her brain an enormous amount of information, made zillions of mathematical calculation, and taken into account a whole mass of psychological characteristics of the people who would be participating in her project. In our terms, she not only solved the most difficult question of purifying the air, but also drew up and analyzed a business plan. And all that in roughly an hour and a half. I thought I had still better clarify certain details. And so I asked her, tell me Anastasia, you made some sort of calculations in your head, figuring out the percentage of pollution reduction and the amount of money to be realized from the sales of your car accessory boxes, filter replacements, and so forth. Calculations were made in the greatest detail and not just with the help of the brain. Stop. Quiet. Let me tell you what I think. Does this mean you could compete with our top-of-the-line computers? Let's say Japanese or American computers. But that is not very interesting, she replied, adding... That is primitive and somewhat degrading. Competing with a computer that a tenth amount to, oh, how can I find you a good ana analogy? That is tenth amount on, on hands or feet competing with a prosthetic. And not even with a full, pros full prosthetic, but just part of one. With a computer, the most vital element is missing. And that most vital element is feeling. I started to argue the opposite telling how in our world there are people considered very intelligent respect in society that play chess with computers. But, but when this and other others' um, arguments still failed to convince her, I started asking her to agree to do this for me and other people as a proof of the possibilities of the human brain. She finally agreed and then I made the invitation more specific. So I can officially announce your willingness to take part in a problem-solving contest with a Japanese supercomputer. Why a Japanese, Anastasia question? Because they are considered to be the best in the world. Well, now it would be better if I do it with all of them at once, so you will not have to ask me again to do such a boring thing. Great, I, ex I exclaimed enthusiastically. Let's do it with all of them. Only you have to think up a problem. All right, Anastasia reluctantly agreed. But for a start, so as not to waste time on thinking one up, let them try solving the problem you put to me earlier and see whether they confirm or refute my hypothesis. If they refute it, let them put forth their own. Let us be judged by life and by other people. Great, Anastasia. Good for you. That is most constructive and how much time do you think should be allowed for them to come up with a solution? I think the hour and a half you took will not be enough for them. Let's give them three months. Three months it shall be, and I suggest the judging be left to anybody who wants to take part. If there are a lot of judges, 
then no one can influence the outcome for their own ulterior motives. So be it, but I would still like to talk with you, you about raising kids. Anastasia considered the raising of children paramount and would always delight in taking about, talking about it. She wasn't particularly excited about any idea of competing with computers. However, I was very happy to have secured her cooperation. Now I want to invite all firms producing state-of-the-art computers to join a competition to solve the above state stated problem. I still felt I had to clarify a point or two with Anastasia. And what prize should be offered to the winner, I asked. I do not need anything, she replied. Why do you think just of yourself? Are you so absolutely, absolutely certain you're going to win? Of course, I am man after all. Well, okay, what can you offer the firm who takes first place after you? Well, I could give them some advice on how to perfect their prim primitive computer. Then it's settled. Anastasia chapter 18. And him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Gospel of John. Upon my request, Anastasia took me to see the ringing cedar, which her grandfather and great-grandfather had talked about. It was not very far from the glade. The tree, approximately 40 meters tall, rose slightly higher than its neighbors, but its principal distinguishing feature was the aureole radiating from its glistening crown. Similar to the halos around the faces of saints depicted on icons, the aureole was not even, it pulsated, and at its upper tip one could see a thin ray of light beaming into the infinity of the heavens. The the, spect the spectacle was dazzling and absolutely charming. At Anastasia's suggestion, I pressed the palms of my hands to its trunk. I could hear a ringing or crackling noise, comparable to what one might hear standing under a high voltage transmission line, only more resonant. It was I who happened to discover a way to send its energy back into space and then have it distributed here on Earth, Anastasia told me. You see how its bark has been torn off in various places? places? That is where the bear was climbing it. It was quite a challenge to get her to carry me up to the first branch. branches. I clung onto the fur on her neck. She would climb and then let out a roar. Climb and roar. After reaching the lowest branches, I was able to clump her up from the branch to branch right to the top. I sat there for two days and thought of everything I could to save the tree. I stroked the tree and shouted up into the sky, but nothing helped. Then grandfather and great-grandfather arrive. You can imagine the scene. There they were standing down below, reprimanding me and demanding that I climb down. I in turn demanded that they tell me what could be done with the tree. How to save the ringing cedar since nobody was cutting it down. They did not talk, but I felt that they knew the answer. Grandfather, old trickster that he was, tried to lure me down, promising to help me establish a connection with a certain woman I had been unable to reach on my own. This was a woman I very much wanted to help. Earlier, Grandfather would only be annoyed by my desire to spend so much time on her instead of doing other things, but I knew that he could not help me, as Great-Grandfather had twice tried to do this behind Grandfather's back, and he fell too. At that point, Grandfather really began putting up a fuss. He sees hold of a branch, run around the cedar tree, and beat the air with the branch, shouting that, I, shouting that I was the most harebrained member of the family, that I was acting illogically, that I refused to accept sound advice, and that he would give my bottom a good whipping. And again, he beat the air with a branch. Now that was a real humming of a threat. And even great-grandfather burst out laughing. I too gave a hearty laugh. In doing so, I inadvertently broke a branch at the top, 
and a glow began emanating from it. And I heard great grandfather's voice, serious, commanding and entreating all at the same time. Don't touch anything more, little one. Come down very careful. You've already done enough. I obeyed and climbed down. Climbed down. Great grandfather silently embraced me. Trembling all over, he pointed at the tree on which more and more branches were beginning to glow. Then a ray formed pointing upward. Now the ringing cedar would, cedar would not burn up. Through its little way, ray, it would give everything it had saved up for the past 500 years to people and to the earth. Great grandfather explained that the ray had formed in the exact spot where I had shouted upward and had inadvertently broken a branch while I was laughing. Great grandfather said if I had touched a ray emanating from the broken branch, my brain would have exploded, exploded as there was too much energy and information in this little ray. That was exactly how my papa and mama had perished. Anastasia put her hands on the mighty trunk of the ringing cedar she had saved and pressed her cheek against it. After pausing for a while, she continued her story. They, my papa and mama, once came up upon a ringing cedar, just like this one. Only mama had been doing everything a little differently. Since she did not know, she had climbed up into a neighboring tree from which she reached out and touched one of the lower branches of the ringing cedar and broke it off, inadvertently exposing herself to the rays which flame up out of the broken branch. The branch had been pointing downward and the ray went down into the earth. It is very bad, very harmful when such energy falls into the earth. When Papa came, he saw this ray and saw my mama who had been left hanging, one hand still firmly grasping the, um, the um, ordinary cedar branch. In the other hand, she held the broken branch of the ringing cedar. Papa no doubt had an immediate grasp of everything that had happened. He climbed up the ringing cedar right to the top. Grandfather and great-grandfather saw him break off the upper branches, but they did not glow. While more and more of the lower ones began glowing, great-grandfather said that Papa realized that it would not be long before he would never be able to climb down. The upward beaming ray with its pulsating glow fell to appear. All that was going on was more and more thin rays shining downward. An upward ray did, did appear when Papa broke off a large, a branch pointing up, and even though it was not glowing, he bent it and pointed it at himself. When it did flame up, Papa still managed to unclasp his hand. The branch straightened and the rays from the branch directed itself toward the sky, and then the pulsating oral form great-grandfather said that at that last moment of his life, Papa Brains was able to take an enormous flood of energy and information, and that he was able in some incredible way to clear his mind of all previously accumulated information, and so was able to gain the time required to unclasp his hands and direct the branch upward just before his brain exploded. Anastasia once more struck the cedar trunk with her hands, once more pressed her cheek against it, and stood, stock still, smiling, listening to the ringing cedar, ringing of the cedar. Anastasia, that cedar not oil. Are its healing properties stronger or weaker than the pieces of the ringing cedar? The same, provided the nuts are gathered at the proper time and with the proper attitude toward the cedar provided the tree bestows them of itself. Do you know how to do that? Yes, I do. Will you tell me? All right, I should tell you. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 19, The Need to Change One's Outlooks on the World. I asked Anastasia about the woman over whom she had a disagreement with, her grandfather. I asked her why she had been unable to, unable to establish a connection with her and why she thought this contact was necessary. You see, Anastasia began her story. It is very important when two people join their lives together 
that they have a spiritual attraction to each other. Unfortunately, everything basically starts with a carnal. For example, you see a beautiful girl and desire to be close to her. You still have not seen the individual, the man or her soul. Very often people join their destinies together only on the basis of carnal attraction. Either that quickly passes or it is transferred to someone else. What then keeps them what then keeps people together? To find a kindred spirit with whom one can attain true happiness is not all that complicated. Your technocratic will, however, puts up massive interference. The woman I am trying to reach lives in a large city and regularly travels to the same place each day, probably to her work. Either there or on the way she finds or mates up with a man who is very close to her spirit, one with whom she could be really happy, and most importantly, one with whom she could bear a child capable of bringing so much good into the world because they could create this child with the same impulsion as we did. But there is no way this man can bring himself to tell this woman that he loves her, and she herself is partly to blame for this. Just think, he looks into her face and sees, as it were her heart's desire, the apple of his eyes, while she, as soon as she feels someone gaze upon her, perks up right away and unwittingly tries to lift her skirt higher, and so on. This man is at once carnally arise, but he does not know her well. And so he then goes to someone he is better acquainted with, someone he feels is more accessible, but still led on by these same carnal desires. I want to suggest to this woman what she should do, but I cannot break through to her. Her brain will not open to the awareness of this new of new information, even for a second. It is constantly preoccupied with issues of day-to-day -day living. Can you imagine? One time I followed her for a whole 24 hours. What a terrible sight. Grandfather then got upset with me for not working enough with the Dachniks and for spreading myself too thin and sticking my nose in where it does not belong. When this woman wakes up in the morning, her first thought is not to delight in the coming day, but not to pre but how to prepare something to eat. She gets upset over some missing food item and then gets upset over something you smear on your face in the morning, like face cream or rouge. She spends her whole time thinking how she is going to get it. She is always late and, and is constantly on the run, trying not to miss first one form of transport and then the next. At her regular destination, her brain is overloaded with how shall I put it, all sorts of nonsense, at least from my point of view. On the other hand, it is supposed to give her face a business-like ex um, expression and fulfill the job tax she is assigned. All this while she is thinking about one of her girlfriends or acquaintances and getting angry at them. At the same time, she is listening to everything going on around her. And can you imagine the same routine is repeated day after day, like clockwork? On her way home, when people notice her, she can put on the appearance of an almost happy woman, but she is continually thinking about problems or her makeup or looking at clothes in shop window. Above all, clothes that will expose her alluring charms, supposing that this will result in some kind of miracle. Except, in her case, everything happened the wrong way around. She gets home and starts house cleaning. She thinks she is relaxing when she watches her television and prepares her meals. But the main thing is she thinks about good things only for a split second. Even when she goes to bed, she is still mulling over her daily cares and stays in the same mental rut. If only she could turn away from her, th fr from her thought even just for a moment during the day and think of. Wait, Anastasia, explain specifically how you see her, her outward appearance and clothing, and tell me what she should be thinking about at the moment when this, when this man is with her. What should she do to make him at least attempt to, to tell her he loves her? Anastasia explained everything in the minute's detail. I should only mention here what I consider to be the most important points. 
Her dress should come to just below the knee. It should be green with a white collar and no cleavage. She should wear hardly any makeup and listen with interest to the person talking to her. And that's it. I remarked upon hearing such a simple explanation, to which Anastasia remarked, there is so much underlying these simple instruction. In order for her, for her to choose that particular dress, change her makeup and look at that person with genuine interest, she will have to change her whole outlook on the world. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 20, A Mortal Sin I, need, I still need to tell you, Vladimir, about the terms under which you will receive money in the bank when there will be a great deal of money in your accounts. Go ahead, Anastasia. It will be a pleasant experience, I replied. However, I was devastated by what I heard. Judge for yourselves. Here is what she set forth. In order to withdraw the money from your bank account, you must meet the following conditions. First of all, for three days before receiving it, you must not drink anything alcoholic. When you arrive at the bank, the manager must verify with the help of the devices you have. Your compliance with this condition in the presence of not less than two witnesses. If this, if this first condition is met, you may then proceed to carry out the second. You must do no less than nine deep knee bends in front of the bank manager and the two witnesses present. When the significance or rather the absurdity of her words finally sunk in, I jumped up and she stood up as well. I couldn't believe my ears and encountered. First, they're going to check my alcohol content and then I am to do at least nine dip, deep knee bends like this? Is that it? Yes, responded Anastasia. And for each knee bend, they will be able to release from your account no more than one million of your rubles at their present worth. I was overwhelmed by sense of rage anger and annoyance. What did you say that for? Well, well, what for? I was feeling so good. I believe you. I was starting to think that you were right about a lot of things that were no logic. That was a lot of things that were, that was logic in your arguments. But you, now I am absolutely convinced that you're a schizophrenic, a stupid, a stupid hick, a mad woman. This latest thing you said has wiped out everything else. It's completely devoid of any sense or logic. That's not just my opinion. Any sane person would agree with me. Ha! Huh. Don't tell me you still want me to write out these conditions in your book. Yes. Now, if you've really gone mad, do you mean to tell me you were planning to write out instruction to the banks or publish, publish this order? No. They will read it in the book and they will act accordingly with you. Otherwise, they can expect to go bankrupt. Oh my God, and I've been listening to this creature three days already. Don't tell me you would like the bank manager to do knee hands with me um, too in the presence of the witness. It will be good for him as, as it will be for you. But for them, I have not set such strict condition as I have for you. So you're only doing this for my benefit. Do you have the slightest idea what a mockery you've made of me? See what the love of a crazy recalse can spill over into. Only it won't work. Not one single, single bank will ever agree to serve me under those conditions. No matter how much you have visualized such a situation. In your dreams, huh? Well, you can stand here and do all the deep knee bends you want. Your nincompoop. The banks will agree, and whether you know it or not, will open accounts for you, granted only those banks which are willing to operate ethically. And people will trust them and come to them. Anastasia went on, not budging, an inch from her position. I found myself becoming increasingly irritated and angry. Angry with myself or angry at Anastasia. Come on now, think. 
how long I've listened to her trying to understand what she was trying, what she was saying. <clears throat> and here she's turned out to be simply half crazy. I started laying on into her, using, to put it mildly, some pretty coarse language. She stood there, leaning with her back to a tree, her head slightly bowed. One hand was clasped to her chest, the other was raised upward, lightly waving. I, rec I recognized that gesture. She used it every time she needed to bring calm to the surrounding natural environment so I wouldn't get fearful of it. And I realized why she needed to calm them down on this occasion. Every insulting or coarse word directed at Anastasia felt like a whip cracking against her flesh, making her whole body tremble. I fell silent. I sat down again on the grass, turned away from Anastasia, deciding I'd better calm down myself and head back to the riverbank and not talk with her anymore at all. But when I heard her voice call out behind me, I was amazed that it didn't have the slightest hint of resentment or rebuke. You know, Vladimir, everything bad that happens to men is brought on by man himself. Whenever he disobeys the laws of spiritual being and breaks his connection with nature, the forces of darkness try to distract the in their intention with the instant attraction of your technocratic way of life or make them forget the simple truths and commandments set forth way back in the Bible and they all too often succeed. One of the mortal sins of men is pride. Most people are subject to it. This sin, I shall not at the moment go into all the terrible disastrous effects it produces. After you return home and try to make sense of it, you will understand, either on your own or through the help of enlightened individuals, individuals who come to you to see you. For now, I should just say this, the forces of darkness, which are diametrically opposed to the forces of light, are every moment working to make sure man does not let go of this sin and money is one of their basic tools in this campaign. They were the ones that thought up this concept of money. Money is like a high tension zone. The forces of darkness are proud of this invention. They even think themselves stronger than the force of light for having come up with money and for being able to, rate, to use money to distract people from their true purpose. This great confrontation has lasted for millennia, and man is at its center. But I do not want you to be enslaved to this sin. I realize that mere explanations are not enough to settle this question, because in spite of thousands of years of explanation, mankind has not understood nor discovered the means of counteracting this sin. It is only natural that you would not be able to discover it either. But I really very much want to save you from this mortal danger, which can corrupt the spirit. That is why I thought up a special situation just for you, one that would cause this device of the forces of darkness to be broken or fail even work <clears throat> the opposite way for the ex extermination of the sin. That is why they have become so enraged. Their anger has been implanted in you, and you, for your part, started shouting your insults at me. They wanted to make me angry at you in return, but I will never do that. I realized that what I thought up would hit the mark precisely, and now it is clear that their system, which has worked flawlessly for thousands of years, can indeed be broken. Right now, I have done this only for you but I shall think up something for other people too. Now what harm is there in drinking less of that alcoholic poison and in becoming less arrogant and stubborn? What were you so upset over? Of course it was pride that was upsetting you. She fell silent and I thought, improbable as it is, her brain or something besides may have put into this comic utterly abnormal situation of doing deep knee bends and a bank such as a deep meaningful meaningfulness 
that there really could be some logic in it. I better think about this a little more calmly. All my anger at Anastasia passed, and its place arose a feeling of uneasy guilt. However, instead of apologizing on the spot, I simply turned to her with a desire for reconciliation. Anastasia, it turned out, <clears throat> felt my inner state. She at once gave a joyful shudder all over and began talking at top speed. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 21, Touching Paradise. Your brain is tired of listening to me, and yet I still have so much I want to tell you. I do so want to, but you need to rest. Let us sit again for a little while. We sat down on the grass. Anastasia took me by the shoulders and drew me close to her. The back of my head touched her breasts, which gave me a pleasant warm feeling. Do not be afraid of me. Let yourself go, she quietly said, and lay down on the grass so that it would be more comfortable for me to rest. She ran the fingers of one of her hands through my hair, as if combing them, while the fingertips of her other hand quickly touched my forehead and temples. Occasionally, she would lightly press down with her fingernails at various points on the top of my head. All this gave me a feeling of tranquility, tranquility, tranquility and enlightenment. Then putting her hands on my shoulders, Anastasia said, Listen now, and please tell me what sounds you hear around you. I listen, and my hearing caught a wide range of sounds, all different in tonality, rhythm, and continuity. I began naming the sounds aloud, the birds singing, and the trees, the chirping and clicking of insects in the grass, the rustle of the leaves, the fluttering and flapping of birds, birds' wings. I named everything I could hear, then fell silent and went on listening. This was pleasant and very interesting for me. You have not named everything, Anastasia observed. Everything, I replied. Well, maybe I left out something, not very significant, significant or something I didn't catch. Not anything important, that is. Vladimir, do you not hear how my heart is beating? Asked Anastasia. Could I really have not been paying attention to the sound, the sound of her heart beating? Yes. I hasten to respond. Of course I hear it. I hear it very well. It is beating evenly and calmly. Try to memorize the intervals of the various sounds you hear. You can choose the principal sounds and memorize them. I select the chirping of some insect, the calling of a cow, and the gurgling and splash of the water in the stream. Now I shall increase the tempo of my heartbeat and you listen to see what happens all around. Anastasia's heartbeat increased in frequency and right away the rhythm of sounds I could hear around me join in with a heightened tonality. That's astounding, simply incredible. I exclaim, 
What are you saying, Anastasia? Are they so sensitive to the rhythm of your heartbeat? Yes, everything, absolutely everything. A little blade of grass, a big tree, even the bugs. They all react to any change in the rhythm of my heart. The trees accelerate their inner processes and work harder to produce oxygen. Is this how all the plants and animals and people's environment react? I ask. No, in your world, they do not understand to whom they should react and you do not try to make contact with them. Besides, you do not understand the purpose of such contact and do not give them sufficient information about yourself. Something similar might happen between plants and the people who work on their little garden plots. If only people would do everything outlined to you and imbue the seed with information about themselves and begin to communicate more consciously with their plants. Do you want me to show you what man will feel when he makes such contact? Of course I want you to. But how will you do that? I shall tune the rhythm of my heartbeat to yours and you will feel it. She slid her hand inside my shirt. Her warm palm slightly pressed against my chest. Little by little, little by little, her heart adjusted its tuning and began beating in the same rhythm as mine. And something most amazing happened. I felt an unusual pleasant sensation as though my mother and my relatives were right there beside me. A sense of softness and good health came over my body and my heart was filled with joy, freedom, and a whole new sense of creation. The range of surrounding sounds caressed me and communicated the truth not a truth comprehensible in all its detail, just something I felt intuitively. I had the impression that all the pleasing and joyous feelings I had ever experienced in my life were now merging into a single and wonderful sensation. Perhaps it is this sensation, sensation that is called happiness. But as soon as Anastasia began to change the rhythm of her heartbeat, the wonderful sensation started to leave me. I asked, more please, let me feel it some more, Anastasia. I cannot do that for long after all. I have my own rhythm. Even just a little bit more, I pleaded. And once again... Anastasia brought back the sensation of happiness just for a short time and then everything faded but not without leaving me with a small taste of the pleasant and radiant sensation as a memory of it. We remained silent for a while and then I felt like hearing Anastasia's voice again and I asked, was it this good for the first people? Adam and Eve, you just lie around, enjoy life and prosper, everything at hand. Only it can become boring if there's nothing to do. Instead of answering my question, Anastasia asks one of her own. Tell me, Vladimir, do many people think of Adam, the first man, as you thought just now? Probably the majority, but what was there for them to do in paradise? It was only later that men started to develop and thought up everything. Man developed throughout through labor. He became smarter thanks to labor. Yes, labor is needed, 
but the first man was infinitely smarter than his descendants today and his labor was more meaningful. It demanded considerable intelligence, awareness, and will. But what did Adam do in paradise? Did he tend a garden? That is something that can be done today by any gardener, not to mention plant breeding specialists. Nothing more is said in the Bible about Adam's activity. If the Bible told everything in detail, it would be impossible to read through it in a single human lifetime. One must understand the Bible. There is so much information behind each verse. Do you want to know what Adam did? I shall tell you. But first, remember that it is the Bible that tells us that God assigned Adam to give names and specify the purpose of every creature living on the earth. And he, Adam, did this. He did what all the scientific institution in the world taken together have not yet been able to do. Anastasia, do you turn to God yourself? Do you ask him for anything for yourself? What more can I ask when so much has already been given to me? It is my task to thank him and help him. Anastasia, book one, chapter 22. Who will bring up our son? On the way back to the river, as Anastasia was escorting me to my motorboat, we sat down to rest in the place where she had left her outer clothing, and I asked her, Anastasia, how will we bring up our son? Try to understand, Vladimir. You are not yet ready to bring him up. And when his eyes first take in a conscious awareness of the world, you should not be there. I seized her by the shoulders and gave her a shaking. What are you saying? What liberties are you taking here? I can't understand how you could have come to such one-sided conclusions. Anyway, even though the mere fact of your existence is incredible, that doesn't give you the right to decide everything yourself and in violation of all the rules of logic. Calm down, Vladimir, please. I do not know what logic you have in mind, but do try and make sense of it calmly. What am I to make sense of? The child is not only yours, he's mine too. And I want him to have a father. I want him to be well taken care of and get an education. Please understand, he does not need any kind of material benefits as you see them. He will have everything he needs right from the start. Even in his infancy, he will be taking in and making sense of so much information that your kind of education will be simply ludicrous. It is the same as sending a learned mathematician back to grand one. You want to bring the baby some kind of senseless toy, but he has absolutely no need for it, no need of it whatsoever. You are the one who needs it for your own self-satisfaction. Oh, look at me. I'm so good in caring. If you think that, we, that you will do some good by offering your son a car or anything else along that line, well, he can get it himself just by wishing for it. Be calm and think about something specific you could tell your son. Think about what you could teach him. Think about what you have done in life that he might find interesting. 
Anastasia continued talking in soft, quiet tones, but her words still made me tremble. You see, Vladimir, when he begins to make sense of creation, you will look like an underdeveloped creature next to him. Do you really want that? Do you really want your son to see you standing there like a dimwit? The only thing that can, that can bring the two of you together is your level of mental purity. But few attain that level in your world. You must strive to attain it. I realized that it was absolutely useless to argue with her, and I cried out in despair. Does that mean he'll never know anything about me? I should tell him about you, about your world, when he is able to comprehend it in a meaningful way and make his own decisions. What he will do then, I do not know. Despair, pain, resentment, fearful conjecture, all these swirled around in, your brain, in my brain. I felt like smashing this beautiful intellectual recluse face with all my night. I understood everything. And what I understood left me breathless. It's all clear. Now it's all clear to me. You, you had nobody to bang with you to give you a child. That business at the beginning, that was all just an act, you sly vixen. You made yourself into a nun. You need a child. But you did get to Moscow. She showed her mushrooms and berries. Huh. You could have gotten you could have got yourself a shag there right on the street. All you had to do was take off that jacket and shawl of yours and you would have takes, takers right off. Then you wouldn't have needed to spin your rab web and trap me in it. <laughs> of course, you need a man who was dreaming about a son and you've got yours. Did you ever think about the child? About your son? One design and advance to live the life of a recluse. To live the way you think he should. Come on now. Here she's been sounding off about the truth. You got an awful lot of gall, you hermit. What is it with you? Truth as a last resort? Well, did you ever think about me? <laughs> me? I dreamt about a son. I dreamt about passing along my business to him. I teach him to be a businessman. I wanted a son to love. And now how am I supposed to live? To live and know that your precious little son is crawling around, unprotected somewhere out in the wilds of the taiga. With no future, with no father, that's what breaks my heart. But that's not something you can understand, you forest bitch. Perhaps, Anastasia quietly responded, your heart will gain the awareness it needs and everything will be all right. A pain like that will cleanse the soul Accelerate thought and summon you to creation. But I was still burning with rage and anger. I wasn't in control of myself. I grabbed the stick. I ran away from Anastasia and began beating the stick against a small tree with all my might until the stick broke. Then I turned to look at Anastasia standing there and oh, how she appeared to me. Incredibly, the anger started to leave. I thought to myself, oh now, I've gone and done it again. I lost control of myself and went wild. 
just like the last time when I swore at her. Anastasia was standing there against a tree, one arm stretched upward, her head bent forward as though withstanding the onslaught of a hurricane. With my anger completely gone, I went closer and began looking at her. Now her hands were clasped to her chest, her body slightly trembling. She didn't speak. Only her kind, kind eyes were looking at me. With the same tenderness as before, we stood there that way for some time, just looking at each other. And I started reflecting along these lines. There's no doubt about it. She is incapable of lying. She didn't have to say anything, but she knew it would be hard and yet she spoke. Of course, that too is a challenge. How can you possibly live if you must always tell the truth and say only what you think? But what can you do if that's the way she is? and can't be anything else. What's done is done. Everything happened the way it happened. Now she will be the mother of my son. She will be a mother, if she said so, of course. She'll be a pretty strange mother. That lifestyle of hers and her way of thinking, oh well, there's nothing to be done with her. Still, She's physically very strong and kind. She really knows nature well, knows the animals, and she's smart. In her own peculiar way, at least. In any case, she knows a lot about raising children. She kept wanting to talk about children the whole time. She'll nurture the boy. Somebody like her will definitely nurture him. She'll get him through the cold, through snowstorms even. They mean nothing to her. She'll nurture him, yes indeed, and she'll bring him up right. And somehow, I've got to adapt to the situation. I'll come and see them in the summertime, like going to a daughter. No way in the winter. I wouldn't make it. But in the summer, I can play with my son. He'll grow up and I'll tell him about people in big cities. At any rate, this time, I've got to apologize to her. And I said, I'm sorry, Anastasia. I got nervous again. And right off, she said, you are not to blame. Only do not be hard on yourself. Do not worry. After all, you were concerned about your son. You were afraid that things would turn out bad for him. That the mother of your son was just an ordinary bitch. That she could not love with real human love. But you must not worry. You must not get upset. You talk that way because you did not know. You did not know anything about my love, my darling. Anastasia, book one, chapter 23. Through a window of time. Anastasia, if you are so smart and omnipotent, that means you could help me. She looked up at the sky and then again at me. And the whole of the universe there is no being capable of more powerful development and greater free freedom than man. All other civilizations bow before man. All sorts of civilizations have the capability of developing and bringing themselves to perfection, but only in one 
direction. And they are all, and they are not free. Even the greatness of men is beyond their grasp. God, the great mind, created man. And to no one else gave he more than to man. I could not make sense, <laughs> at least right off, of what she was saying. And again, I uttered the same question, pleading for help, not fully understanding what kind of help I need. She asked me, What is it that you have in mind? Do you want me to cure all your physical ailments? That is a simple matter for me. I already did this six months ago, only in the principal area of need. No benefit came about. The dark and destructive elements, common people of your world, have not lessened in you and your various aches and, pain, aches and pains are trying to come back again. You witch, mad woman hermit, get out of here this instant. You're probably thinking, right? Yes, I answered in amazement. That is exactly what I was thinking, you read my mind. I surmise that that is what you might be thinking. Indeed, it is written all over your face. Tell me, Vladimir, do you not well remember me at least a little? The question dumbfounded me, and I began careful, carefully examining her facial features, especially her eyes. I really began to think that I might have seen them somewhere before, but where? Anastasia, you said yourself that you spent all your time in the forest. How then could I have seen you? She gave me a smile and ran off. A short while later, Anastasia came out from behind the bushes, dressed in a long skirt, a brown button cardigan, her hair down up and a shawl, but without the quilt quilted jacket in which she had greeted me on the riverbank, and the shawl was tied differently. Her clothes were clean, though not stylish, and her shawl covered her forehead and neck, and I remembered her.